Okay, uh, good afternoon. I would like to uh, welcome everyone and welcome especially warmly our, our guest speaker this afternoon, uh, I believe uh, 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 whom I met about two years ago in Berlin at Humboldt University. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, Luis Kalimowska, Dr. Kalimowska was uh, a doctor candidate at that university and has been working on a project which she has uh, completed and successfully completed in July this year. Congratulations. Uh, this was uh, a, a dissertation on the post 9 11 US American and British uh, fiction, uh, supervised by, by Professor Martin Klepper, who uh, is uh, at Humboldt and who has actually been here to, to give the talk uh, quite a while ago. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that, that you could come here. Uh, 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 today, Karina Galimowska, Dr. Galimowska, uh, uh, is uh, a visiting scholar at New York University in, in New York City. Uh, and also uh, continues to have an affiliation uh, with uh, Humboldt, Humboldt University as an adjunct uh, uh, teacher there. Uh, she has uh, published extensively on uh, topics which are related to the dissertation on uh, uh, post-9-11 uh, uh, texts of culture uh, and, and has given a number of of presentations on this topic. I was interested to learn that she had graduated from uh, the Chatsky in in Warsaw, uh, that she lives and was born in Germany, and uh, um, moreover, uh, that she has been writing a column uh, called Nachbarn, which means neighbors, uh, for the Lidl Gazette. So she's also a, a, a columnist, a journalist. Uh, but today, of course, Dr. Galimowska will speak uh, to us on the topic that, that, that stems from, from the dissertation she had just defended. Uh, the, the title of the talk is Navigating the Post 9 11 Metropolis Reclaiming and Remapping Urban Space in Contemporary US American Novels. Uh, welcome, Rebecca Flores. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody and welcome also from my side. Um, thank you for being here and thank you so much Thomas, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and to talk in Warsaw and to present the, uh, the results and to present my project in general in my hometown for the very first time. As you can sense from the title of my today's presentation, and we don't need a Java update for now, as you can sense from the title, I will be uh, talking about um, the importance of the metropolis and also of uh, the urban space in general for uh, post-9-11 American fiction with a specific inclination towards the genre of the novel, which I argue is specifically well suited for this type or this kind of analysis. In other words, and you can see that a little bit um, more closely here, if we get this to work. Um, I will be talking about city maps, about mappings, and also about navigating. Navigating, I mean moving, and if I say moving, I mostly mean walking for the purpose of today's talk. And I also will be talking about remapping on very different layers um, and in very different, um, under very different aspects. And while I aim at giving you a general overview of the large number of texts that could be analyzed and, and looked at from that particular perspective, I will then try to focus on um, three novels, and I hope we'll have enough time to discuss those in greater detail. Um, I'll focus on three novels, namely, and you can see them here in uh, chronological order of publication. Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Safran Poe, published in 2005, Netherland by Joseph O'Neill, 2008, and also Peju Calls Open City, 2011, so the most recent out of those three. And I do realize we'll be moving on, um, different, um, on different levels of abstraction as well, so if you have the impression that you have missed a link, or, uh, missed a link or that you have um, you're lacking a depth into something, please do not hesitate to ask me afterwards, since I do realize it's going to be a lot of input um, on many different levels of the set. Okay. In New York, you might find it hard to board the E train if you're heading, for example, from Queens over to Lower Manhattan. You might find it hard to board a train going to World Trade Center without thinking for a moment about the Twin Towers that are no longer there. However, when you live there for long enough, or actually you notice this after you've been there for a week or so, so it doesn't really require that much time, 
you realize that World Trade Center is a place like any other in New York, and that it becomes an important landmark and um, point in your daily commute and relation with the city while you're navigating it, as you can <coughs> see here, for example. You might also find yourself recalling the September 11th um, attacks or acts of the, uh, urban terror in general when, for example, desperately looking for a garbage can on the streets of London, which are nowhere to be found, for those of you who've been there and looked for one. You might also think of these um, attacks when you pass by the Euston Tower, Euston Square in uh, central London, when one of the, where one of the buses on July 7, 2005 exploded. By the way, since we're talking about the interrelation between reality and fiction, there is a brilliant um, passage in Chris Cleave's novel Incendiary, uh, an epistolary novel, novel when, uh, where the um, narrator comments the fact of lacking or missing um, garbage cans on streets of London in the following way, sarcastically. <clears throat> there were no garbage bins and no Muslims with jobs. We were all much safer. 9-11, then, has changed our perception of urbanity and our urban social behaviors. <clears throat> this shift in perception, but also expectation and a certain ability to adjust, influence our daily routines, our reaction and association patterns. And by ability to adjust, I mean the fact that we are all prepared to sacrifice our privacy for um, a very vague notion of what in the United States is called national security, and the equivalent of which we have pretty much in every single Western metropolis. The changes in the life of cities and individual urban practices around the world have influenced the way cities are reflected in literature and also in other, of course, media and arts. And this is precisely what I am interested in. So this reciprocity of representation, writing, and living in a given metropolis. When studying American novels that were written and published after September 11, 2001, the plots of which explicitly allude to the events of that day, one of the first things I noticed uh, was that most of the plots of these novels are set in big cities. However, shortly I had this revelation, I also had to face the fact that I was in fact not, uh, not the first person and not the first scholar who has noticed this. And I was also not the first one who wanted to write about it, since a couple of months later a book by the German scholar Birgit Davis came out, which is entitled Grand Zero Fiction, and which, um, in which she identifies uh, in the US American context New York City and Washington DC as two most prominent of the metropolitan settings for the novels. Just to give you an idea, in the year 2011, when the book was published by Rita Davis, she identifies about 168, about, I think it's precisely 168 titles, um, which she calls ground zero fiction. So she deals not only with novels, but expands over other literary genres, but this is pretty much the body of work that you can, um, so that you, could, you get an idea, uh, which has been obviously extended since then. So now I know this, I look closer at the way cities are written in these novels, and how far they reflect the real cities in question, and to what extent imaginary places are being uh, created that then influence the way real cities develop or change. I also looked at the way characters are placed within the featured cities, how they relate to them, and how or whether this relation changes after 9-11, and if that's the case, then why is that so? And in my project, I specifically focused on New York City and on London because I was interested in the transatlantic relation and, you know, the entire political setting after 9-11. So the, the faithful support of Tony Blair for uh, George W. Bush's administration and all this and the entire alliance and what kind of an influence does it have on the fiction that's written there. And it was also easier to compare or easier to work with that body of work because of the language it's written in, so, uh, because it's in English. So all this happens because post-9-11 fiction mirrors altered social and spatial practices and features characters that are equipped with a great <coughs> capacity but also a great desire to move. So if you read these novels, you observe characters who constantly move somewhere for whatever reason. Sometimes they don't even have a reason, but they move somehow, and mostly they walk. So I claim that this reappearance of the Flaneur figure uh, leads to a certain remapping 
uh, of the city through movement and through, to discoveries of its organic character and encounters, <clears throat> so these characters encounter the often ruthless politics of the enormous body of the metropolis. This organism, wounded, frightened and, frightened and furious, can only be narrated after it has been understood, so in a way tamed. And an, an interesting thing is that there is a, uh, in this large body of literature, there is a strong return to the motive of um, experiencing and presenting um, cities as organic structures, so as bodies, as brains, as um, cardiovascular systems. Um, all this um, showing how at one, um, at one stage in such a system something collapses or happens, the entire system is influenced, um, the catastrophe spreads, uh, fear spreads like a virus, all these metaphors are very prominent. And the motive of a malfunctioning body poses a challenge for doctors and therapists who also make a strong appearance, uh, appearance in postmanual and fiction. So we have neurosurgeons and psychiatrists who walk cities and feel like they're walking a brain. Uh, it's an interesting metaphorical um, aspect of that fiction. Choosing the novel as a genre places the study in the research tradition and analysis of city novel and follows Falka Klotz's argument that the novel and the city appear as two similarly constituted systems, and I quote, the novel and the city appear as two similarly systems, as systems which to a large extent correspond with each other in their wholeness as well as in their particular parts and their relations to one another. This means that the city finds in the novel the most appropriate instrument thanks to which it can enter the literary status without radical loss of substance. Also, the other way around, the novel finds in the city an object which stubbornly, like no other, demands an exhausted full capacity. It also, of course, corresponds to the notion of the novel being the modern literary genre par excellence, and hence the literary place most suitable for the city, which, and I'm quoting Robert Alger here, is the principal theater of bourgeois life and also the form of a collective existence that undergoes the most spectacular dynamic growth throughout the modern period. So there is a link between the concepts of modernity as you can find them in the metropolis and also in the novel. And the focus of my project was to examine how geographical, social and also political characteristics of a metropolis are linked to portraits of individuals in order to address the notion of many things, but mostly trauma, memory, and the construction of the other capital O in this a metropolitan surrounding. So I'm looking at literary mappings here, which have a long tradition, and which I'm sure you're familiar with as well. Mm, these maps show a certain reciprocity of fictional worlds and the real worlds, and I'm showing you just one example. This is London. Um, probably the most prominent out of these ones here uh, would be 221B Baker Street in London, which as some of you might know is the Sherlock Holmes' museum. Sherlock Holmes is, as we know, a fictional character <coughs> who has never lived in 221B Baker Street. However, this place there in London is to be found and visited. Um, a parallel example, to, just to bring us back to New York for a second, would be a grave of Charlotte Temple, who is also a fictional character, and which can be found at the um, Trinity Church graveyard in Lower Manhattan. This character dies at the end of the novel in New York, and this is where you can visit your grave. So we have these instances present, even if we maybe don't realize that every, um, you know, every, um, every time, but they're there. Remarkably, since we landed in London here for, for just a second, Characters um, of the novel set in London post 9-11 are not as eager to explore their city as their New York-based counterparts. In responding to 9-11, British fiction anticipates a metropolitan catastrophe floating in the London air, so to say, and mirrored in a number of texts, covered with what Monica Ali, the author of Reclaim, uh, calls the New York dust and surrounded by fear that was blown together uh, with this New York dust over the Atlantic, characters of the post-9-11 London novels hardly ever leave the safety zones of their 
the immediate surroundings. So they hardly ever leave their borrowed basically. Whereas the, the, the characters featured in American fiction are permanently on the move somewhere. Okay, um, we're moving uptown or up brain here. <clears throat> Two slightly opposite statements emerging from, from September 11, 2001, which dominated the public discourse of the immediate aftermath, were uh, that what happens, it's getting a bit dizzy, I realize, what happens was unimaginable, and at the same time, it was like a movie. The sight of the towers falling was both utterly incomprehensible and wholly recognizable. And all kinds of New York related destruction fantasies, and I'm sure you know probably more than I do about those, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with some, if not with many. So, all kinds of these New York related destruction fantasies have been part of the US American pop culture, so pretty much since the beginnings of the 20th century. So, according to Slavoj Žižek, and I quote, America got what it fantasized about. And precisely that was the biggest surprise, unquote. Another American scholar, uh, Max Page, claims that September 11 was then New York's own form of an ultimate disaster movie that was followed by a shift in imagining and picturing the city. After 9-11, I quote, suddenly everyone loved New York. It became a blameless victim, unquote. And to imagine its destruction, a motive that has been present, as I said, for years and years, um, became tasteless and insensitive. And in fact, many old and well-known uh, motives became taboos. I don't know if you might recall it, there was a promotion of the, I believe, fourth season of the AMC series Mad Men, which was featured with a man falling down a skyscraper, which in the United States was highly criticized, uh, not to say it was considered scandalous. Um, the fact that some of the characters in uh, Don DeLillo's novel The Falling Man live in Godzilla apartments is an intended provocation that clearly alludes to the perverse history of imagining New York disasters caused by imaginary monsters. That, however, shows that <coughs> fantasies of the city's end have not really stopped after 9-11 and uh, remain present in U.S. culture. What Page, and this is, this is like the quote of the century, what Page calls, I quote, late 20th century American lust for disaster porn, unquote, and Mark Zelter, America's wound culture, as well as the obsession with fantasizing about the destruction of New York, have been part of the national narrative inscribed in culture. And I quote again, again, Max Page, to destroy New York is to strike symbolically at the heart of the United States. No city has been more often destroyed on paper, film, or canvas, and no city's destruction has been more often watched and read about than New York's, unquote. And I have just a few examples here. You see um, to your left, upper corner, uh, King Kong from 1933, remade several times afterwards. Um, the Attack of the Giant Baby, that's a <laughs> series of uh, short, a collection of short stories from the 50s. Um, then we have um, the, the Beast from 20,000 Phantoms, 55, and also um, Godzilla, like the modern Godzilla approaching Manhattan from God knows where, from yeah, Staten Island direction, but somewhere there. So if a city is a text, then this text can be read, reread, and rewritten in a number of ways, which are strongly linked to it and dependent on the particular subject that is exposed to, to it. There is hence a strong relation of interdependence between an individual and the city which influences the construction and identification of the self, and I'm sure you can relate to this. I, I believe we all somehow identify through the places we live in, whether we want it or not. They become parts of who we are. And um, to quote one of my colleagues from Humboldt University, Evelyn Kilian, who works on London a lot, she says, I quote, the self can be changed in its encounter with the city, just like the city is reshaped and reorganized in the mind during each excursion, end quote. I claim that the given metropolis is the source of literary energy for all post-9-11 city novels. 
It provides ways of self-identification and redefinition in times of major political, social, urban, and always very personal crisis. The urban confusion the featured characters in the novels uh, come to experience is expressed in different ways, but in most cases it is set around the individually tailored process of reclaiming the given urban space after the attacks. Some of the characters start walking excessively with or without a plan, according to the same pattern, following a different planned route every time, like for example Oscar in Fowler's Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, which I'm going to turn to in a second, or getting lost in the city, like for example Julius in Pajukov's um, Open City. There is, by the way, this is something that I uh, um, came across when I was preparing the talk, there's a gentleman and a lady at the back of this room who are talking all the time, hello? Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, there, there is something that I stumbled across when I was uh, preparing this talk. Um, it's an app which is called um, Drift. And you can, unfortunately it wasn't working on my, I couldn't download it on my um, Droid phone, but you can use it if you're using a, an iPhone, apparently. It's an app that helps you getting lost in a city that you know. <laughs> and this is something that I was thinking in the context of this literature that I'm working here with. Um, we are so equipped with GPS devices and with, we're familiar with places we walk through. It's, if you walk in Manhattan, there is, it's so hard to get lost because of the grid structure of the, of the island, right? I mean, you, there are hardly any uh, surprises there. That it might be worthwhile checking out this app, I was thinking as a new navigationary practice, how to deal with your <laughs> surroundings. Okay, other of my characters uh, move through the city using a subway or other means of transportation in order to explore its different parts and to escape the well-known and spatially limited neighborhoods where they live and work. For example, Hans, the main character, the main, the main protagonist in Joseph and Neil's Netherlands. All, uh, all of, uh, excuse me, out of all the means of traveling through the city in order to experience it, walking, being the preeminent spatial practice, is the most prominent one for scholars and philosophers examining cities and urban processes. So if you think of, if you think of walking as a theoretical and philosophical concept, and if you think of theorists who work with walking, then you will have like what? Like Baita Benjamin, Edward Soja, you will have Charles Baudelaire, you will have I am Sinclair. Um, who else? Michel de Sarton. Um, then you will have the whole school of psychogeographers. And an interesting thing about it, and I'm not going to go deeper into this right now because it's um, <coughs> we're drifting away from the actual subject. But the interesting thing is that they're all men. Uh, so there is there is a, a certain gender aspect to the, the the core activity of walking, which is interesting, and um, which I worked on a, a lot as well because I was interested in how. Um, how it really has to do something with who we are and why we walk. Not only the city, but also its skyline and its buildings often become anthropomorphized and felt for in, post in the post post novel. They are subjects to emotional reactions and attachments. New York is often referred to, and I actually, uh, I did that too in my talk several times already, New York is referred to as a wounded body or wounded city. The towers are referred to as twins. And this process is really reflected in, among others, the, um, the novel that I already mentioned, uh, Don Delilo's Fallen Man, where the, um, the Godzilla apartments, where the characters live in, are described as a building that has a face. And it's, um, it also has its own weather system created by its height, you know, which happens with high buildings, with tall buildings. Godzilla's wind currents, and I quote, can knock old people to the pavement, unquote. So there is the, the, you know, the sense of losing control over something that has been man-made and constructed for people to give them shelter. This uh, relation to architecture is very uh, problematic. While Oscar is exploring the city, um, while Oscar exploring the city is connected to the state of newness that I introduced as a concept associated with childhood somehow, um, the other walker that the novel uh, that is featured in this novel is his grandfather, who um, has a completely different view of the city. He's namely looking for his own past, and this is something I'm sure you can relate to when you 
revisit a place you've been to before and you look for places you remember and then you figure out they don't exist there anymore, they've been replaced. Uh, this is something that happens to him. And I quote, I spend most days, I spend most of my days walking around the city getting to know it again. I went to the old Colombian bakery but it wasn't there anymore. <coughs> In its place was a 99 cent store where everything cost more than 99 cents. I went by the tailor shop where I used to get my pants taken in, but there was a bank you needed the cartridges to open the door. I walked for hours down one side of Broadway and up the other, where there had been a watch repairman, there was a video store, where there had been a flower market, there was a store for video games, where there had been a butcher, there was sushi. What's sushi and what happens to all the broken watches? Paradoxically, this clash of perceptions of these two characters, two generations, of, two generations apart, contributes to a level of communication. These two traumatized individuals walk the same grid of streets in search for new and old meanings. In other words, the city becomes a basis and a tool for communication, a set of signs, a form of a meta-language, if you like, that remains when, while facing the unspeakable other communication, patterns and systems fail. The metropolis is what keeps char these characters alive because it gives them a purpose to act and possibilities of expression. It also provides them, and consequently the fictional texts that these characters are products of, with a spectacular literary energy. The metropolis that Julius in Pleasure Calls Open City walks through is almost a decade later still marked with the wounds and pain of September 11. He's being confronted with different aspects of the 9-11 urban reality. And there is this wonderful quote that I'm going to present to you in a second. What happens to him is, um, he's one, uh, to the character, he, uh, during one of his walks he's being approached by a tourist. And the tourist asks him, since he looks like a local, obviously, for some reason, or whatever, for whatever reason. And he asks him, excuse me, how do I get to 9-11? And this is something that makes him think about the relation between space and time and history. So this is the fragment. The place has become a metonymy of its disaster. I remember the tourist who once asked me how he could get to 9-11, not the site of the events of 9-11, but to 9-11 itself, the date petrified into broken stones. So this is when 9-11, at, at this very instant uh, in the novel, um, is localized on the city's map and symbolically inscribed to it. It becomes a place, and as such it can be approached in spatial terms. It can be walked and rewalked. it can be written and rewritten, claimed and reclaimed, but as the novel suggests, it can never disappear, since it's petrified into the very core of the city. To say just one more thing about the unusual cricketer flaneur from Netherlands, uh, from uh, Joseph O'Neill's novel. Uh, he, just like Oscar in Power, is extremely loved and incredibly close, and the psychiatrist, the Ni Nigerian psychiatrist in Tejo Calls Open City, is looking for something that is difficult to grasp <coughs> or to describe. He looks for new meanings, similarly to the solitary Baudelarian flaneur, whom I mentioned um, before. All three of these, or all these three characters, uh, create a new dimension, something that Baudelaire uh, ca calls the fantastic reality of light, um, and which allows them to observe the world around them closely, but at the same time remain hidden from them by wearing a mask. So this is the Flannerian approach. You observe and you make notes and you learn, but you're never a part of it, or you don't want to be a part of it. Similarly to Oscar in Forward's Extremely Loud, Julius exercises a, a certain appropriation of the topographical system to include uh, Michel de Sartor here for a second. And at the same time, he's constantly lacking the place. This is the main concept of de Sartor. While you walk, you experience a lot, but it also means that you're lacking an actual space or place where you feel comfortable. The city, um, perceived as an urban brain. This is something that I mentioned, and this is something that's very prominent in Peugeot called Open City, and the psychiatrist Julius walks through it. 
So the city as urban brain is a set of connections between urban neurons or actors, transmitting meaning and operating within the system. Roland Barthes talks in this context about urban semiology and analyzes the city as language, which is also a set of signs, as we all know, through which connections or meaning and meanings are being established. Different parts of the city are connected to one another and to its inhabitants. Julius, this is one more interesting, the last more uh, interesting thing about Julius that I'm going to say today is that he, once he walks through the city, he cannot detach from the city's past or the city's future. He sees everything at the same time, and he has the ability to connect um, these three dimensions. So something that none of us will be able to do, and this is. This is an instance in which the power of fiction, the power of fiction, becomes so prominent. You can create a character who can do it. Um, you know, that's great. There is somebody who can see all this. So you can see it from the first settlers and the new Amsterdam that they have, through what he lives in now, and he also sees parts of its future. To conclude. Writing and rewriting the post-9-11 metropolis, as I was demonstrating, is an ongoing and possibly unending process, which encompasses different forms of remapping and navigating the city. Different texts written after September 11 form a city corpus that stretches far beyond the temporal frame of 2001 and where we are now. Being highly intertextual and constantly mixing different levels of fictionality with reality Post-9-11 fiction not only contributes to shaping contemporary metropolis, but also contextualizes the already existing city literature within the altered circumstances. Characters and places written before get new meanings and are put into new contexts of the post-9-11 city. <coughs> and there are many texts the study could be extended uh, to um, and I'm not going to go into details, but um, it could include also other genres. It could include drama, which has been a very prominent genre after 9-11. Uh, after it could be stretched to include visual cultures and uh, series and films, um, and so on. The city as a space of constant transformation remains an unpredictable terrain, the reflection, seismograph, and co-creator of which is fiction. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I also, the, the brain that we were staring at, the connection of tube lines, has been designed by Tribal Design and commissioned by HSBC. I was also thinking it could be something that the, 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 the character in um, Jonathan Safran Paul's novel, the, the, the old guy who's looking for these tailor shops and finds a bank. This is something he could be <laughs> uh, exposed to, uh, namely the the, uh, the commercial or the ad of HSBC at his favorite corner. So, um, thank you. Um, if you have any questions or uh, immediate comments, suggestions, or concerns, please be my guest. Feel free.